trying to think about what I should talk about tonight, and I realized we had a presentation that we put together a couple of years ago about capacitors. I didn't personally develop this, this uh, presentation. I had on my team a few years ago uh, an engineer by the name of Steve Crump. He was basically, or he is an analog engineer, and he'd been working in the analog field for over four decades. I wanted to point out to you guys that he actually had his, he owned his own company designing and manufacturing mixer panels, like maybe in the 70s. So he was doing mixer panels back when they were 100% analog. And when he saw the change to digital coming through, he kind of gave that up, got a full-time job again. And when I hired him, he was actually working at Bose in Massachusetts on their uh, military noise-canceling headphones or headsets for tank applications. Apparently, if you're a soldier inside of a tank with a big diesel engine running in there, it's super noisy. So they have these noise-canceling headsets with microphones so the guys can talk to each other. So he brought a lot of really excellent ideas with, uh, with him to come to us. He retired back in 2012, and he now lives in Ocean Springs, Mississippi. He was just the greatest colleague and friend that I could probably ever ask for, and he was a super gracious man. So I really miss working with him, and, and he's the one that put together this information. If we look at a typical IC power amplifier circuit, we see there's a bunch of different capacitors. So we have a capacitor on the power supply for decoupling. We have capacitors on the input for DC blocking. Uh, we may have some capacitors to set up voltage references or oscillators. EMC filtering, DC blocking caps if you have a single-ended load, things like that. So there's a lot of capacitors that we use in audio. One thing that Steve pointed out to us was the cheapest capacitor that you could buy, the dielectric material is called Y5V, and it's what he refers to here as a high K capacitor. So that is the, the dielectric constant of the material that makes the capacitor up. The reason people like them is because you can get very high capacitance in a relatively small package. But what you find is there's actually a large variation just from the tolerance of the capacitors and also from the temperature variation. What we show here is there's some tolerance due to the just the rating of the capacitor and then there's also some tolerance of the temperature that you're operating the material at. So the total variation can be quite large and it's also a function of frequency. Y5V and the other one, it's not quite as common but you can also see a Z5U. So like if you go to DigiKey, you can sort by the material and you can find different caps. The problem that this causes is if you use this on the input circuit and you, you try to make like for example a high pass filter with it, if you try to design it for a nominal 3dB point here, the variation of the capacitor can cause your 3dB point to move around quite a bit. From unit to unit and across temperature, you'll end up with different filter cutoff frequencies. And that's, that's something that we don't want to have happen. We want that to be as close to the nominal as possible. So the other problem that we found is they have a large coefficient of capacitance versus DC and AC voltage. And what that means there is if you have a capacitor and you have, say for example, you have a, a 10 volt capacitor and you run it at 10 volts, it only has about 20% of the rated capacitance. So you lose a whole bunch of the capacitance there. So what you'll find is a lot of people derate them like 50% or something. So if you have a 5 volt supply, you use a 10 volt capacitor for that. And the Wi-Fi-D material is really bad for this. So you can see the capacitance falls with the DC bias as much as 80%. And that again here causes problems where it shifts the cutoff frequency of the filter that you're trying to design with this capacitor. So the, the Wi-Fi B caps are really bad about this. The other thing that we found, which took us quite a while, because in the beginning of when we started developing our audio, audio amplifier ICs at TI, we weren't very focused on the THD performance. So the applications that we were going at, they didn't demand really low THD. We then started making headphone amplifiers where we could get a lot better THD performance. And what we found was a lot of times the input blocking caps that we would use caused an increase in THD, especially at low frequency. 
And what we figured out is it's caused by that voltage characteristic of the capacitor. So as the capacitance is changing, it causes issues with the THD, and you end up with poor THD performance. And the thing that's really interesting about this, and, and Steve didn't talk about it in here, but we actually went out and bought a whole bunch of different capacitors with the same dielectric material, same package size, same voltage rating. And we found that there was a wide variation in the THD performance from one vendor to the next. We never actually tried to figure out why that was the case, but it was very interesting data. Here, kind of, you know, this is the THD, the amplifier, and all of a sudden at low frequency, it starts rising dramatically. And what we found is if we use X5R or X7R material, the THD is not nearly as affected by that anymore. Whenever you're trying to, to use a capacitor in series with the audio signal, you should try to use an X7R, or even better is uh, some of the, the COG. Or, the problem with the COG caps is they're usually pretty small values, so you can't get them in over a couple hundred picofarads. So if you need like a microfarad cap, you have to use a different material. The second thing that we found that caused a lot of problems with capacitors is a lot of our parts have differential inputs. We do that to try to minimize noise and also help with common mode noise. So what we found is if you have a capacitor on each differential input and they're not matched very well, the RC time constant from the input resistance of the amplifier coupled with the capacitor causes the RC time constant is slightly different based on what the capacitor value is. And you end up actually having a mismatch in the charge of those two, and that actually turns up as a differential signal to the amplifier. Of course, the amplifier doesn't know that it's not supposed to be there, so you end up with an input pop from this. So what we found is if you use a, like a 5% capacitor where the tolerance is much better, you end up having these two charging curves line up much better, and you don't end up with any pop that you need. If you talk to like super high-end customers, people that are really into audio, they're willing to, to put up with pop. Like, it doesn't bother them, you know. I turn my amplifier on and it pops, and they don't really care. But consumer companies, that drives them crazy. They don't want to have their stuff pop. Actually, my joke is that our design guys spend like three times longer trying to fix pop problems in our IC designs than they do actually designing the amplifier itself. <laughs> and a lot of our applications questions are caused by this as well. I have an MSU grad working for me right now by the name of Justin Bohr. He's actually right now working on a pop problem. It's a big problem for us. So for these reasons, we like to avoid using Wi-Fi V caps in audio circuits. I remember one time I was in an internal training session where Steve was talking about this material and there was a, a colleague of mine from our power management unit. I said to him something like, you know, we can't use Wi-Fi V caps. You guys must use all these in your power converters, your boost and buck converters. And he said, no, we, we don't use them either for the same reason. So the only place I think people really use these is maybe a motherboard thing where they have just a zillion capacitors in parallel and they want to get a whole bunch of capacitance on the rail for like a microprocessor that changes speed and all of a sudden it has a huge current draw coming out of it. So we recommend using caps made from materials like X5R or the X7R material and with a 5% tolerance to make sure the charge rates are the same. Sometimes, it, especially for our higher power, higher performance amplifiers, we'll actually use film capacitors which have an even flatter uh, voltage characteristic. They don't have a, as much of a DC bias problem as the ceramic capacitors. And like I mentioned earlier, you'll find different people have different rules of thumb, but a pretty good starting one is you should have your cap be rated at twice the operating voltage. So that'll help get close to what the capacitance value is that you want to try to get in your circuit. So then for the input circuits, the application voltage is the input stage supply voltage, or the bias voltage. And then for the outputs, it's the output stage voltage. This is specific to some of our older amplifiers. Some of our older amplifiers, we had a bypass capacitor to set a mid-rail voltage. In general, all of our amplifiers, or most of our amplifiers, run off of a single supply. So we get an internal bias voltage of VDD divided by 2. And in order to kind of filter that a little, we use a bypass capacitor. And in order to prevent pop, you want to make sure that the 
input capacitor charge time and the bypass capacitor charge time meet some relationship that we usually talk about in the data sheet, and that prevents turn on and turn off pop. The, the problem is if the bias comes up too fast and the inputs are still charging, you'll actually end up with a pop that gets amplified by the amplifier. For decoupling capacitors, probably know that you want to put a decoupling capacitor on every one of the ICs in your design, right? So why, why do you do that? What are some of the reasons we do that? Reduce the case of instantaneous current drop. Okay. Any other reasons? Okay, good, good. TI, we focus a lot on Class D amplifiers, which are high switching edge rate devices. So there's a lot of peak current that gets drawn from the power supply. So in these cases, we actually use a, a parallel combination of capacitors. So we'll use, for example, a one microfarad ceramic capacitor, and that has very good high frequency characteristics. That helps with uh, most of our amplifiers switch at either 250 or 384 kilohertz. And that one microfarad cap helps prevent overshoot from that fast switching edge. And then for the actual audio signal, we'll use a bulk cap, like a 10 microfarad cap, to provide more energy for the audio signal itself. I talked to a couple people today who said they were taking some EM classes. And this is one of the key areas in circuit design to help minimize the amount of electromagnetic interference that you generate with your circuit, you'll find people actually stack up different values of the capacitors because the curve of the caps kind of don't overlap each other and then you get a better attenuation across the full frequency band. If you look at uh, some of our automotive class D amps, which have to meet super low EMC requirements for automotive applications, have a a 10 microfarad, 1 microfarad, 0.1 microfarad, and you know, maybe something even a little smaller than in parallel. And that just helps minimize the amount of noise that gets generated. A lot of times when we look at customer schematic, we'll find that they do a lot of work to optimize either the power traces to the IC or the ground traces to the IC, and they completely ignore the opposite one. You have to pay attention to both of them, you can't just look at one. The other thing that you'll find is, like for, especially for a high switching frequency part like our Class D amplifiers, the actual area of the loop that you're decoupling across is very important. You want to try to minimize that area as much as possible. If you have the traces farther away on your PC board, you'll end up with a lot of ringing and voltage spikes on the power supply. For some of our parts, that actually causes a reliability problem because our customers run them pretty close to what the maximum rated voltage is to get the maximum output power. And they'll have these spikes on it, which will end up causing the MOSFETs to get damaged. So we like to try to place the caps, like say one millimeter from the IC, and try to make sure that you have strong power and ground connections as well. Again, you want to minimize the inductance of that loop there so you don't get any voltage spike. So this just talks about that again. And again, just minimize that loop area there. So. He laid out a board with these two combinations here where there was some uh, series inductance here because of the, the distance and the trace width versus good decoupling. He measured like about a five or six volt difference in the voltage spike that you got here at the switching edge. And like I said, for customers that run our amps right kind of at the edge of the rating of the, of the amplifier, that's enough to cause reliability problems for them. It can also cause degradation in your audio performance, and then it also causes problems with EMC. So you end up with problems with that. We have both high frequency decoupling caps as well as the lower frequency ones, which these ones really help the audio band, so the, they help with the audio signals you're trying to get through. And you also want to try to make sure that you have a good connection to your power supply as well, so that you don't end up causing a limitation in the power being able to get to the IC itself for wherever the power is entering your system. The placement of the buff decoupling caps is not as critical as the ceramic ones because they are supplying audio bandwidth signals, so there's not as much opportunity for spikes to get generated there but they can also help stabilize the power supply voltage so you don't end up with oscillations or something like that in your circuit.
For the coupling caps, we like to use surface mount ceramic caps because they have a much lower series inductance than a leaded capacitor. Again, we don't want to use Wi-Fi-B stuff. X5R, X7R are better with tolerances of 10% or less. Bulk decoupling can be either ceramic or electrolytic depending on how much bulk you need in your circuit. The ceramic caps have a limitation of how much capacitance they can get. Let's see, let me show you. I don't know if you guys have played around with single-ended versus bridge tie load amplifier circuits. For a lot of our amplifiers, basically um, for lower voltage applications, in order to get more power to the load, we have two amplifiers that drive each end of the load. So it essentially allows us to double the voltage that's applied to the load, which gives you four times more output power. So especially for like 12 volts and below, it's really critical to do that, otherwise you can only get a couple watts out of an 8-ohm speaker. However, if you have like a headphone or other applications where you want to have a single-ended output, and you have a mid-supply rail amplifier and <coughs> single-supply amplifier, you have to put a DC blocking cap to prevent DC voltage from being applied to the speaker, which will cause it to either burn up or get extended outside of the gap. The thing that you need to remember there is you now have a filter here of the cap and the load in series. So that means that this cap has to be a pretty large value. In like a headphone application, you'll find that somewhere around 220 microfarads. And if you're going to drive like an 8-ohm speaker, then it needs to be like 470 microfarads or even more than that. Just remember that you have to make sure that the high-pass filter that you generate here you're able to get the low frequency into the speaker that you're trying to drive if you're using a single amplifier circuit. The other thing you need to focus on here as well, you want to use low ESR caps with a ripple current rating greater than the low peak current rating. Electrolytic caps have a ripple current rating because of the series resistance inside the capacitor. As you apply an AC signal through that, it causes it to heat up. You want to make sure that you check the rating of the cap to make sure it's good for that. For our Class D amplifiers, a lot of times we use an LC filter on the output. And in that case, remember there that you want to design that for a particular frequency response. We actually have an app note that goes into about how to design the LC filters for Class D amps. So if you're, if you're working with Class D amps, I suggest you take a look at that app note. You can find it on our website. So this is another interesting plot that Steve added in here. He's calculating the attenuation of the output filter for a Class D amp. For ideal components, if we just assume that we have an inductor and capacitor, we end up with an LC filter response that looks like this. So it's a very nice looking response and everything looks good. So if you run it in Spice, you're going to get something that looks like this. If you then actually go and build it, you're going to get a response that looks like this here. And that's because the inductors have some parallel capacitance, and the capacitors have some series inductance, and it causes the shape of the response to be a little bit different than you would think ideally. That's a, another thing that you need to take into consideration when you're working with the Class D amplifiers. This is another problem that we, we don't see this problem as much as we used to, but we had customers that when they would design the LC filter, they would end up with a notch in the impedance response of the filter. And the problem is if that dip in the impedance of the filter corresponds with the switching frequency of the Class D amplifier, it ends up drawing a lot of current from the power supply. It causes the chip to heat up, the inductors to heat up. So you want to make sure that you keep that notch in the filter frequency response away from the switching frequency of the amplifier. 
there's some interesting information that Steve has collected in the appendix here. So this is like I was talking about earlier about how you use parallel combinations of caps to help extend the area where you have a low impedance. So he's showing here kind of where the where the lowest point is for a 1 nanofarad, 10 nanofarad, and 100 nanofarad. You can see that they're kind of at different frequencies, so when you use those stacked up together, you get a better overall response across the whole frequency range. And then this is another plot here that just shows the difference in the relative capacitance against a DC voltage applied to it. So again, here you can see the difference between the Wi-Fi-V and the X, X5R material, dielectric material. So that's kind of what I want to talk to you guys tonight about capacitors. So what questions do you all have? What difference does your, with those, the grounding technique that you use on the board make, so like a star versus just a flat field type thing? Mm -hmm. We generally recommend for our devices to use a, a, a ground plane. We found that really works best, and you can sometimes you can get better performance if you use a uh, like a star grounding system, but a lot of times you'll end up just uh, causing more problems than it's worth. The other thing that I see a lot of people try to do is they'll try to set up a, a ground split, and again there we found like most times that just causes more problems than it, than it solves. So it's really better just to use a solid plane, and then the currents can go where they want to go on the ground plane. You don't have to try to ride them around. So the boards that like you would test would be like a four layer, two single layers of internal kind of things. We do. We try to design most of our EVMs for each one of our boards on a two layer board, so that we have kind of the, you know, the lowest denominator case. So people that if they have more layers, they can do that. Sometimes we'll focus on more layers if we know the application is something. Like, for example, a cell phone application where they have like eight, eight or 12 or 14 layers or something crazy, you know, and those. But like, most of our stuff is consumer electronics, so they, they, don't, they don't want to use any more layers than they have to because each time you add a layer, it adds cost to the manufacturing process. So they try to, try to minimize that. Um, and then for, for decoupling, you said like a bulk cap, the, the distance didn't matter as much, so would you have a single bulk, like large, like aluminum or tailum type of job, like by the power supply, and then a small, like point one mic, like on each pin? Yeah, basically that's the way we, we usually do it. And also, some if our amplifiers are stereo amplifiers, we usually have two power, like power supply for right channel, and power supply for left channel. So we may put like a decoupling capacitor in each one of those, a, a bulk decoupling cap close to each one of those, as opposed to just one of like the input connector. It, the closer you get it to the amp, the better it is. Um, but yeah. The bulk one? Yeah. Okay, so. It's still important, it's just it's not as critical as the ceramic ones for high frequency switching amps, which is what we kind of focus on. Give that a hand.